بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يحمله ونصلي على رسوله الكريم We begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers including the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as I greet you no longer from my sitting room in my home in the Caribbean island of Trinidad but I greet you from Ilford in London in Britain with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and uh, Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak to all of you. We thank Allah who gave us blessed Ramadan. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. No. But I hope we have all recited the whole Quran in blessed Ramadan from cover to cover. Alhamdulillah, I see you shaking your hands. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. And that we have all recited the whole Quran in Ramadan the way that Allah recited it. And then commanded the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam that you must now follow my way of recitation. Is this in the Quran? Is this in the Quran? Why are you not shaking your hands? <laughs> yes, this is in the Quran. Ba'athahu <laughs> Quran, and when I have recited it, O Muhammad, sallallahu ta'ala, you must also follow that way of recitation. You didn't know this is in the Quran? Huh? Where have you been all the time that I've been teaching? And then while reciting the Quran in Ramadan, for every day you had a juz, a juz means a part, and you never cut any surah in a part. You always recited the surah completely, and so you had the biggest test of all on the first day. When you had the right to recite surah to Baqarah, and you were not allowed to cut. You had to recite the whole surah. So may Allah bless all those who recited the whole Qur'an in Blessed Ramadan. Ameen. And now you must try to encourage others and teach others. And if you teach someone to recite the Qur'an the correct way, despite the critics, don't worry, don't worry. If you teach someone to recite the Qur'an the correct way, and that person now keeps on reciting for all the rest of his life until the angel comes. Look at the barakah. Sadaqatun jariya. You keep on getting blessings even when you are in your grave. So now, we turn to this as the first uh, talk that I have uh, in Britain. And uh, it is in connection with our brothers and our sisters in India uh, who are now facing danger unprecedented in their history. Unprecedented in their history. So now then, would you show me by raising your hand those of you who were born in India or your parents were born in India? Okay, so we have about half the audience. So you have some connection with the subject. And our topic is India's Muslims, the way forward. And I've chosen this topic because of so many Indian Muslims contacting me and begging me to do something. Apparently, uh, the, the, the scholars of Islam in India, perhaps, have not been able to satisfy them. And they felt the need for me to bring my Islamic eschatological input into the subject. So I've been 
are bombarded with lots and lots of requests from India. And some of them sending me emails informing me of what is happening on the ground in India and in Kashmir. I'm keeping, I've been kept informed all the time. And I want to begin with one email, <laughs> one email from India, just one, uh, on the subject of the plight, the unprecedented plight that India's Muslims now face. Bismillah. This lecture is not going to be long, but the question and answer session is more important than the lecture. Because it is in the question and answer session. Is this live? Is it being right? Okay, so you might be able to get some some people right sending you um, messages from India while I'm speaking. No, okay. It is in the question and answer session, I, and my hearing is declining. So instead of you having to repeat your question 10 times, it's better that you write it out and send it to me, because I have to get a hearing aid, okay? Now then, it is your questions that you will pose to me on this subject that will help us to move forward in the directions which are the most urgent and important, inshallah. So be careful with your questions. Bismillah. Here is an email from an Indian Muslim. It's been a long time since last I sent an email to you. But I do listen to your lectures without fail for several years now. To again brief you, I'm the same person who was working abroad and upon your advice, I left the job and came back home to India. And I am from Mumbai, the commercial city. <coughs> I've started my own business here in Mumbai and I've also started a mango plant um, garden and so on in the remote mountains. I just saw your YouTube a video regarding the way power, the lecture on the 6th of May. As I'm a local, I want to just share with yourself some condition, information about conditions about Muslims here in India, which is becoming from bad to us. And in the near future, I fear that there will be mass genocide as hate crimes have already started and they are killing and pressurizing the true voices as is done in every fascist regime to curb rightful voices. At the time of the Malhama, if people like me go to a village which is in the mountains, but as the Muslim population there in the village are sparse, villages are sparse, so they might ransack 20 or 30 houses in a village. Some villages have only five to 10 houses, whereas in larger cities like Mumbai, Hyderabad, Muslim population is sizable in the ghettos. We as Muslims are not on one platform. We are divided on sectarian platforms. Some of us are brethren, <laughs> some of us tablighis, some of us deobandis, some of us ahli hadith, and all divided naturally due to vast differences in culture and language in the north and the west and the south and the east of India. In spite of having two 100 million large population in India. We are a divided community for the above reasons. I request you kindly so to kindly guide us. We who will retreat in villages during the Malhama, guide us in respect of local riots where our population is sparse. 
and also others who don't have religion and continue to remain in the cities. Guide us. What should we do? Your guidance at this juncture is very important for our society is in a very trying time. Take care of your health and may Allah give you long life and good health. This brother is warning us of genocide. We can't take this email lightly. And my first comment is that one person cannot, on his own, deliver the answers as to what should be done. It has to be a collective effort with large numbers of scholars. But at least I would have put my small input, not claiming that this is the last word. And at all times, we must never lose faith in Allah. If we want to move forward, and if we want to get Allah's help, then Allah has said in the Quran, Allah will not intervene to change your condition. No, regardless of how pathetic it may be, He will not do it unless you take the initiative using his guidance to change your own condition. So if we are to get Allah's help to save our brothers and sisters, our children in India, from what he is talking about, genocide, it is clear that Allah's help will not come, despite all the dua, unless and until we use his guidance to change our own condition. No matter how bitter it may be for us, unless we accept our mistakes, we can't move forward. And that's the first stumbling rock we face the resistance of our people to accept that we have made mistakes. So long as they defend Muslim rule over India, for centuries, Hindu India, Muslims ruling over Hindu India, when Muslims are a small minority, and Hindus in India are the overwhelmingly large majority. And yet this small minority with armed force, with military power, is able to establish its rule over India and continue to rule over Hindu India for centuries. We have to ask our question, <laughs> Was that Mughal Empire, which established Muslim rule over India, was it established in accordance with the guidance located in the Quran? If there are those who want to defend it, that we had the right, we had the right to use war weapons to conquer India and to establish our rule over India, well, then don't turn to me to ask me for help now. Because Islam is not imperialism. And I'm reading now on Mughal rule over India. I'm reading the subject. And I have found that there is no evidence at all that the wars which were waged to establish rule over India were wars that were jihad, just war. A jihad or a just war is never waged, never waged, unless and until you have 
explored and exhausted all possible peaceful means to resolve the problem. When you have tried everything and nothing has failed, then you fight. That is jihad. And jihad is when you are attacked and you are defending yourself. That is jihad. And the jihad, jihad is when a people are oppressed. Al mustadafina min al rijali wa jirani. People who are helpless, men, women, and children, and they are oppressed and they are crying out <laughs> for help. Then you are allowed, not allowed, you are obliged to fight, to liberate the oppressed, provided they are asking you to come and liberate them. Hindu India never ask Muslims to come and liberate them from oppression. And so Muslim rule over India was not established in accordance with the guidance of the Quran. And we cannot therefore defend it. We have to call a spade a spade. And we have to accept that the Hindu is right, is justified in being very harsh and very uh, reject, rejecting Muslim rule over India and it wants to have some revenge for it. We have to accept they have the right to do that. And we were wrong. So the first step on the road to resolving the plight and the predicament of India's Muslims today is to change our own condition using Allah's guidance and to call a spade a spade and to recognize that Muslim rule over India was Islamic imperialism and had no part of Islam in it. And we have to apologize for what was done in the name of Islam and say, no, this is the religion of Islam does not condone what was done. More than that, the Mughal rule over India sometimes expressed itself with Mughal emperors and their, their armies destroying Hindu temples. So we have to answer the question. Prepare yourself, Indian Muslims. You have to answer this question, yes or no? Does the Quran permit you to go and destroy all the Hindu temples in India, yes or no? If this is your view, that the religion of Islam permits you, requires you to go and destroy the Hindu temples as the Mughal rule did, then don't turn to me for guidance. Please go ask somebody else to help you. Ask somebody else to help you. I have not found this in the Quran. No. That you have, you have the right to go and destroy the Hindu temples. And sometimes they will destroy a Hindu temple and build a masjid in its place to add some salt <laughs> to the wound. So we, we say that in order to start the process of going forward, we ask the scholars of India who would listen to this lecture, or the message will be reached out to them, that the first step on the road to trying to resolve the problem is to establish that mobile rule over India and the destruction of Hindu temples was not permitted by the religion of Islam. Once you're clear on that, then you say, we apologize for what they did. And we do not want to be blamed for what they did. So when that part of the state is clear in the hearts of the Hindus, that these people condemn what they did before, and these people condemn the destruction of our temples, it is now possible to reach out at least to some Hindus in India. Number two,
when Britain was leaving India and the signs were there, Muslims had to decide their future. And at that time, I'm afraid this lecture is going to last too long. I have to, I have to cut, <laughs> I have to cut. The Muslims of India decided to respond with a movement which took India by storm. It captured the hearts of India, including the Hindus. Yes. It was a movement like no other <coughs> like no other movement had ever been in history. It was called the Khilafat movement. And it was led by men who knew the religion of Islam and who lived the religion of Islam. Huh? Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar, his brother Maulana Shaukat Ali. <coughs> Sayyid Suleiman Madwi, Mufti Kifayatullah, Shoaib Qureshi. These were, these were people who knew Islam and who lived Islam. But the leader of the Khilafat movement, Mulana Abdul Bari, was Mashallah, Mashallah. What a scholar. What a scholar. And <laughs> The leader of the Hindus turned to Maulana Bari, Abdul Bari, this is um, Mohandas Gandhi. And he said, but you want to get the, the, the British out? And when the British have been driven out, you want that the Muslims should live in accordance with Islam. But Maulana, we want the same thing. We want the British out. And when the British are gone, we don't want to have a secular state, secular republic, no. We want that the Hindus of India should live in accordance with Hinduism. So we want the same thing that you want. So let's just join forces. This is Gandhi talking. But Maulana, we have one condition to join with you. You have to stop killing the cow. Maulana Bari said, no problem, no problem. We respect your religious beliefs that you consider the cow a sacred animal. We living in your country, we respect it. And so the alliance took place. Hindu Muslim alliance and fraternity. That was the way forward. That was the way forward. But then it failed. Not because of failure on the Muslim side. Because Someone was hijacking the Hindu religion to take it on a different road. And they eventually assassinated Gandhi himself. And then came Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Who never, never claimed to be a sheikh. Never claimed to be an Islamic scholar. He said, I'm educated in Britain as a lawyer. Good. But he said, I recognize also the way forward is Muslim Hindu fraternity. And he was right. He was right. Like Maulana Bari was right. Like the Khilafat movement was right. And uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah then continued to try to struggle. He was known as the ambassador of most Hindu Muslim fraternity. Good. And he tried also. And he failed. Not because, not because he didn't try enough, but because the leaders of the Hindu India, who were disposed of, eventually disposed of Gandhi, they did not want it. And so Pakistan came into being. The mistake which was made, and we're paying a terrible price for that mistake now, and perhaps you have to show compassion for Jinnah, 
because he was ill, he would die soon, and there was tremendous amount of havoc and all these things in the, par in the partition. So you have to excuse him. The mistake which was made was that on the day that Pakistan was born, Muhammad Ali Jinnah should have addressed India and say to India, this was not our choice. It was not our choice to part from you. Our choice was to live together, like the Khilafat movement and Gandhi wanted to live together. That was our choice. Your leaders did not allow us to succeed. But we say to you today, that Pakistan is born, we say to you that that still remains our preference. And if ever the door is open for us to talk, to try to reconcile and to live as Hindu-Muslim fraternity, we will be ever ready to enter that door. If this statement was made, on the day when Pakistan was born, we would not be living with the predicament in which we are living today. We then have even more sadness. For which the Indian Muslims are paying the price that from the day that Pakistan was born, it never had the freedom to have its own government. From the day that Pakistan was born, Pakistan never had the freedom to have its own government. With leaders who put Pakistan first and take decisions on the basis of loyalty to their own people. From the day that Pakistan was born, Washington has always consistently sought to determine who is in charge in Pakistan. And what we just had recently is yet another example of Washington taking over. You cannot appoint a chief of staff of the Pakistan Pakistan armed forces without permission from government, from Washington. So Pakistan became, excuse my language, an American puppy dog. An American puppy dog. And India, Hindu India, was moving in a direction consistently in the same direction that we will not accept the, the, the creation of Pakistan. We want to undo it. And if we have to do it by force, we'll do it. We do not accept Pakistan. So when Pakistan follows this monstrously foolish and sinful policy of being an American puppy dog, the answer is that the plight of the, of the Indian Muslims become worse because Allah has prohibited Muslims in the Quran from ever being friends and allies of an alliance of Jews and Christians. And it is that alliance of Jews and Christians which today is known as the Zionist alliance and controls power in the modern way. It does not control power in Russia. It does not control power in China. But it does control power in the modern West. But the strange thing is uh, Allah in his kindness has blessed me to penetrate and understand certain verses of the Quran pertaining to eschatology because I have done an enormous amount of work preparatory. I have done the planting. 
and now I'm reaping in understanding the Quran. So when I explain this verse of the Quran, as no one perhaps had ever explained it before, it made sense. Here is the verse, which shows that Pakistan's history as a puppy dog of America was in conflict with the Quran. And Turkey's membership in NATO is in conflict with the Quran. But the, the Darul Ulum would not listen to me. I've done everything I can to teach them, but they would not listen to me. As though knowledge is a package which is sealed, must not be opened. And you simply have to transfer it from one generation to another. If Iqbal had accepted that, Iqbal would never have been what he is today. If my teacher had accepted that, he would not be the Mulana Fadlur Rahman and Sari, the light that he is today. Every year his profile is going higher and higher. If I had followed that methodology that they have in the Daru, I would not be what I am today. Here is the ayah. And remember, you never take one verse of the Quran in isolation by itself, because you can make a mistake. You have to study the Quran the way you studied it. Come on, help me. The stars. Which surah of the Quran tells you that? Come on, help me. Waqiyah. Surah al Hmm? And I take an oath by the position in which the stars are located. Good. Go to that. And you, you must study the Quran the way you study the stars. Now let's go to this verse of the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a command. And when Allah gives a command, a Muslim must submit. If you don't, he'll throw you into the hellfire. You have to submit to him, otherwise you're a kafir. If you don't submit to him, you're a kafir. Yeah, oh, you who have faith in Allah, do not take Jews, and Christians as your friends and allies, who are friends and allies of each other. Did you hear that? Do not take Jews and Christians as your friends and allies, who are friends and allies of each other. And whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and allies, you belong to them. You no longer belong to this Ummah. Allah does not provide guidance for it. wicked people. So the Quran is speaking about an alliance of Jews and Christians which did not exist when the Quran was revealed. When did it come to pass? Only in 1897 was the Zionist movement formally established. <laughs> but before that, the work was being done. And a Judeo-Christian alliance emerged in the world, in full fledged. It is this Judeo-Christian alliance that Allah is talking about in the Quran. It is a Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance. <coughs> and this is 1897. And Pakistan was born after 1897 or before? After. Huh? After. <laughs> How long after was Pakistan born? This is 1897. Ready? So where are the scholars when Pakistan is born in 1947 to ensure 
that Pakistan is not embraced by that Judeo-Christian Western alliance. Okay? But the people of Pakistan understand. The people of Pakistan have their hearts in the right place. They don't want to be a part of the puppy dogs of America. They don't want it. But what about the chief of staff of the armed forces? <laughs> what about the political establishment? And they take US dollars and they betray the country. And so there is a failure on the part of those who are teaching the Quran in Pakistan to, te to teach the people the Quran that Allah in the Quran has prohibited us from maintaining friendly ties and being allies with the United States of America and Britain and the West. Is there any alim in Pakistan who have used this verse of the Quran to warn the people, warn the country? And even though I've been teaching this for 20 years or more, none of their ulama will ever accept what I'm saying is correct. What more can I do? So the predicament of the Indian Muslims is now compounded by Pakistan's misguidance. If Pakistan was walking on the right path of not entering into the embrace of the West, as they did with something called CENTO, a military, military alliance. And now they're going back again into that NATO, but they're doing it through the back door. Because Turkey is a member of NATO, and if you hold on to Turkey's tail, as the chief of staff of the armed forces is doing, no, I, with these words, I'd never be able to enter Pakistan again, of course, but somebody has to speak the truth. If the armed forces of Pakistan are holding on to the Turkish tail, it means you're in NATO. If the armed forces of Pakistan are holding on to the Turkish tail, and Turkey is in NATO, you're also in NATO. Do I have to repeat it a third time? So how will Allah help you? How will Allah help you if the Muslims of India are to get help and Pakistan cannot help them? Who will help them? Who will help them? <laughs> All right. Finally, Muslims have been in India for centuries now. It is not for me to go into that history and find how they became Muslim, how why did they convert to Islam and so on. That's not my feel. My feel is to accept that the Muslims have been in India for several centuries. But more than that, at the time when <laughs> the British were leaving, India. And at the time when the Khilafa, the Ottoman Khilafa was being destroyed, abolished in Constantinople, the Indian Muslim scholars of Islam had the highest status in the whole world of Islam. This was no mean achievement. The world of Islam respected Indian Muslim scholarship. So then how come? I don't know the answer. Why is it that the effort was not made more than it was made to enter into dialogue with Hinduism? <coughs> so that you will have Indian, uh, Hindu, Muslim dialogue on religion, on religion. Instead, what we had was Guru Nanak making an effort 
and uh, <laughs> the effort failed because what he did was to create a new religion. <laughs> I don't think he wanted that. I believe he wanted to buy, to build bridge, build bridges. <laughs> the effort was made by a Mughal emperor, uh, at Akbar, <laughs> to create a new deen that he called Deen Ilahi. <laughs> what? At least, at least he was trying to build a bridge. I read a book recently, very well written book, on one of the sons of the Emperor Shah Jahan. His name was um, Darashuku, Darashuku, Muhammad Darashuku. And here, here was a mind, an intellect. This is a very fine intellect, a searching mind, and a good heart. And he also was struggling, struggling to have dialogue at the highest level, spiritual dialogue between Islam and Hinduism. And he did achieve some success. His success was so great that the present Indian government of Modi has decided to honor him and have a road in New Delhi named after him. That is a sign of his success. But the, I, am, I am struggling with the subject, but I have a suspicion that it was because of proper methodology that they failed, all of them. The same problem that we have with the Darul Room. And that if they had followed the method methodology which produced Dr. Iqbal, if they had followed the methodology which produced my teacher, Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, if they had followed the methodology which has produced my scholarship, then it is possible that you could have had productive dialogue between Islam and Hinduism in which you have shown greater respect for the Hindu religion. And you have recognized in Hinduism that which the Quran recognizes to be truth. Is it too late for that to be done? <laughs> I think so. I believe we missed the bus because we did not have the scholars to be able to establish that dialogue. I want to give you an instance of a Hindu pundit in my native island of Trinidad. This pundit was considered to be the leading pundit in the country. Heads and shoulders above everybody. And his name was Doon Pandit. And his son is the one who told me of what this pundit did. In one of the towns of Trinidad, there was a hurricane and the, the roof of the masjid was blown away. <laughs> the, past, <laughs> the pundit lived in a, close by. And he went to the Imam. He said, Imam, your masjid roof is gone and Juma is coming. I've come to offer you the mandir for your Juma. Salatu Juma. So the Imam said, Pandaji, thank you for your offer. But how can we perform our Salat in your mandir with all these? Uh, what do they call multis? Idols. But the G said, no problem. I remove them all. I will remove them all. The pundit remove all the multis, cleared the temple, and made it a place where Salat al Juma could be held. The Imam then accepted. The offer and the Salatul Juma was conducted in the 
in the Hindu Mandir for six weeks. After which the temple, the, the roof of the masjid was repaired and they went back. I then found a book written on Doon Pandit in Trinidad and I got the book. And I read the whole book. And there's no reference to this in the book. <laughs> they left it out. And his own people were very angry with him for what he did. But here is the heart of the leading Hindu pundit in Trinidad. And so, if we are to make an effort to establish dialogue, and we show respect for the Hindu religion, show respect for it. We judge people by their conduct, not just by their beliefs. And we find people whose hearts are not corrupted with hatred for Islam. And we were to establish dialogue with them. I want to suggest to you before I end, that this would be a good start, if it's not too late. Finally, let me end with a warning from eschatology. The Jewish religion has been hijacked by the Zionist Jews. And their conduct and their behavior is contrary to the truth which has come from Nabi Musa the Christian religion has been hijacked in the West mm. to such an extent that a man can now marry another man and get a marriage certificate. The Hindu religion is hijacked today by Modi. His is a warmongering government with eternal hatred for Islam and Muslims. I feel sad to have to speak like this, but this is the truth. And wherever this lecture reaches in India, Hindus should recognize that I'm speaking the truth. That he and his government are hijacking the Hindu religion. And so there is a parallel between India and Israel and the West. So long as that parallel remains, it remains a hopeless state for the Indian Muslims. If that parallel is ever to be changed, we can't change it from outside. It is India's Hindus who will have to change it to ensure that India does not run on the same parallel line with Israel and with the West. And so our way forward is my parting statement. The way forward is to reach out to that part of Hindu India whose heart has not as yet been corrupted with eternal hatred for Islam and Muslims, and to establish dialogue with them with the hope that we're able to move forward in a positive way. I thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.